difficult time and a very difficult question. And if I have to see what the statistics as of today morning are, then there are confirmed number of cases in India is about 8,453 as of this morning. The active cases are 7,192. The recovered ones are 972 and the deceased ones are 289. And I'm just looking at the COVID India 19 uh, tracker at this point in time. So two things stand out very importantly. One is, if you look at the R0, which is the infectivity of this virus, and you compare it with the COV-1 and the MERS, which was the Middle East uh, respiratory virus, the infectivity is almost two and a half, three times. But, and the R0, which is how many people will this virus infect without a lockdown, with a lockdown and with no lockdown. So if you look at that, the number is about 2.5, which means that the virus is going to affect at least two and a, two and a half people who get exposed to a person who has a COVID positive disease. And if we did not have any protection or any lockdown, then the virus would affect about 406 people, which is huge. And as we all understand and know that India has very, very specific concerns. We are a country where uh, our systems are not uniform. But despite that, how are we doing? So there was a, there is a study just uh, two days back, which has been published by the uh, uh, government uh, by, in UK by the University of Oxford, which describes the stringency index as far as the performance of different nations are concerned. And the two very, very important things that we have done well, because we have a stringency index of 100, which is the strictest. And the two very important things that India has done is that it has enforced travel bans and an enormous amount of emergency investment has gone into healthcare. So by those index, though we have a pattern which is very similar or fairly similar to what is happening in Italy and Spain, but we are still doing reasonably well. So if you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, what is important in terms of caregiving and healthcare provision, the important thing to understand is that we not only have to give a treatment, which is not the best treatment, but the optimum treatment in a given time and situation, we have to make sure that there is an optimal utilization of resources. And the most important thing is the clinical safety of the healthcare population. So if you look at the functional paradigm that we talked about in the last slide, the important two things that we need to understand and keep in mind is that to enforce the requirement of an optimal treatment and optimal utilization of resources, and ensuring the healthcare, uh, the safety of the healthcare community, what we need to do is a reasoned pragmatism. And a very important component of that is reducing a face-to-face -face interaction and follow-up. Now, if we were to understand reasoned pragmatism, the components of what we would like to call a reasoned pragmatism is maintaining emergency surgery capabilities and we are talking of orthopedic surgeons, protecting and preserving our workforce, fulfilling our alternate surgical roles. So these are desperate times where we may be called upon by the hospital or the system to help out into not pure orthopedic, but other surgical situations, especially hospitals like ours, the uh, trauma center at Delhi and ours, which are uh, being proposed to be made COVID hospitals and fulfill alternate non-surgical roles. So surgical teams and surgeons, including orthopedic surgeons may actually be required to be trained. And that is what is happening on the ground as of today in at least my hospital, that all surgical disciplines, all residents, all faculty are not only being trained into 
the use of personal protective equipment but are also being trained into the use of uh, the ventilators and the facility uh, for a covid patient so that's a very very important component at this point in time because the most critical uh, rate limiting step in managing and coming out safely of this epidemic is uh, keeping the healthcare force and intact without much damage and without much loss so why do we need it because subspecialty orthopedic emergencies are going to become increasingly difficult so you're not going to be having a, a, an arthroplasty unit or a trauma unit or a spine unit or an arthroscopy unit functioning and handling their own problems and their own patients that is going to be an absolute no no with increasing amount of uh, healthcare resources being used into the covid-19 pandemic and specially medical problems the availability of manpower and the availability of uh, resources to optimally run surgical theaters is going to diminish and it has diminished substantially which affects the way we are going to be able to offer care to our patients surgeons deployed uh, are being deployed and have been used and trained to support non surgical roles as i just mentioned so if you look at the plan of action the triaging has to be as you would do for a mass casualty the healthcare provision uh, is essentially done to provide maximum benefit to the patient who comes to our doorstep as well as at the same time making sure that we are going to take care of the workforce that we have and this process is a very dynamic process so the protocols and the sops that are being made are being modified on a daily basis there are government of india guidelines are changing being modified daily as per the situation when we started off our doubling time in the first 10 days for the pandemic was 1000 patients in 10 days the next doubling time took about 5 days for the next 1000 and the next thousand happened in two days and as of today uh, the numbers at least i can say for my state that have increased yesterday is about 130 which is amazing and it is alarming so depending upon how different different parts or, or different epicenters and different hotspot areas are evolving in the country the guidelines are changing constantly and the testing facilities are constantly being put to uh, stress and newer methods are being evolved so as of today the government of india has uh, uh, enabled uh, and and uh, certain centers or hospitals and have identified certain institutions and hospital in the country to mentor and establish within 5 days 38 new testing facilities across the country which will enable the testing to be about 1 lakh per day so what are the priorities that we are dealing with in dealing with such emergency situations so the first thing that we need to do is maintain the possibility of treating our emergency cases so initially when the pandemic was smaller uh, had affected india on a smaller front you could do a speciality centric treatment but as the pandemic is evolving the workforce has become very very important and as i said in even in our hospital the orthopedic registrars the orthopedic fact and not now currently but maybe down the line even the faculty would need to be participating into the covid 19 pandemic treatment or the the hospital functionality so very very important and this is what we have already done is to have a mixed surgical rota and what i mean by a mixed surgical rota is that normally to deal with a surgical emergency or an orthopedic emergency if you had a faculty uh, a, a two trainees or two uh, post ms one or two post ms people and one or two trainees to be dealing with an emergency situation you actually now have one chief operating surgeon one assisting orthopedic surgeon and the rest of the team may be a surgical registrar or an obst obstetric registrar or an ent doctor or uh, or, or somebody from another specialty so that is a change which is very very important which actually is going to definitely affect 
the quality of surgical care that we are going to be able to give if we are full hardy and try to use our entire uh, pure specialty orthopedic teams and try to take up orthopedic surgery work as normally we do and take up then we are going to exhaust and hurt and uh, damage our healthcare resource which is the most critical uh, thing in the handling of the pandemic what is important here is to rotate team leaders so the person for example an obstetric uh, case is being done in the emergency so the team leader has to be an obstetrician if you have uh, a ear nose throat specialty uh, uh, surgery which is uh, getting which is needing to get done then you'll have to rotate the team leader according to the specialty so that and those mixed and different evolving roles are taking increasing importance you have to rest some members at home so that once the person who has been on a shift for 10 days or 2 weeks goes home he can rest and the person who has been at home quarantined at home can come back and is healthy enough to take care of the work and the load that is coming in the other thing is that preservation of workforce is vitally important we need to talk of and think about and execute non surgical solutions where possible our indications have changed they will not change but they have changed we need to use personal protective equipment optimally and the basic fact about ppe is that it is not uh, available not only in india but it has become a real problem across the globe so not only is the world talking about reusing pp but it's talking about customized pp and i'll show you an example of what we have done and it it's working fairly well and it is allowing us to give a personal protective equipment not only to our doctors to our nursing staff to our ward boys but also to our housekeeping facility rest and recuperation is extremely extremely important so once you have done a two week or a one week duty rota you need to be off for two weeks so it's the period of incubation that is 0 1 to 14 days you have to be off and if you become symptomatic in that period you need to be tested as a suspect and if positive you need to be treated as a patient and if suspect and your under and your covid test result rt pcr is negative then you can go home and be quarantined for the next two weeks so that you can be ready for further duty and what is happening more and more across the world is that this recuperation period of healthcare staffing is constantly getting reduced because of the shrinking manpower so all the more reason that we take due care we cannot be jumping into surgical indications like we would do in a normal time of a non emergency or a non pandemic it is something that is wisdom it is something we need to understand because before long if we become unwell rather than doing 20 we will not even be able to do four psychological support when people are indoors when people are dealing with uh, something that is a, that is spread a lot of fear not enough information evolving information changing guidelines you are bound to be anxious and lots and lots and lots of psycho psychosocial support is required so it's important that you keep talking to family to friends you look at positive things those are very important areas and triaging areas of risk that's of vital importance so this is a a, a division of uh, how the pp needs to be adjusted across the four areas so 11 one areas are the screening desks and the flu desks where all you need is a disposable cap and a triple layer mask with a normal uniform and gloves if you look at the covid suspect ward or the covid positive ward you need to have if you have enough you can have a pp but the the guidelines suggest as of today the icmr guidelines suggest that you need to have a disposable cap a triple layer mask uh, has gets changed to an n95 and if you can wear goggles those are good enough it is not important to for everyone in the uh, in the uh, covid suspect and covid positive wards to be doing a round and to be looking at patients the way you would normally look at the, look at patients because essentially they are okay patients they are not unstable they just have fever cough uh, and uh, they will hold up for some time only thing is they need to be monitored and quarantined in the hospital level 3s are, are are situations which we are essentially talking about now a ot system a non covid icu uh, a non covid icu where you need customized pp like i'll show you or a full pp which is the advice pp and the level 4 like we use the uh, the suits body suits for our arthroplasty situations 
they are probably going to be important but there is no testing and no efficacy and they are not universally available so this is level 3 is essentially what we are looking at uh, a full pp or a customized pp with the normal uh, ot ot dresses that we would need to use for uh, an ot situation so this is what uh, we have designed and come out with so this attire is a full body suit which contains of a which contains a hood it has a neck strap it has uh, uh, it, this is impervious material it has a body suit which goes down to the uh, to the legs ankles the uh, person wears uh, uh, the fushu covers which extend up to the knee and beneath this is a impervious back opening gown black back closing gown on top of that they wear an n95 or a triple layer mask and a visor and double gloves and this doubles up extremely well we have we are trying to reach a situation where even our healthcare worker housekeeping staff ward boy uh, is able to get a pp because the the original pps that uh, are supposed to be there are not available so in times of covid it's extremely important that you improvise make sure that the health and safety of the healthcare community is maintained and that is of absolute primary importance more than anything else so triaging operative indication so we take lessons from wuhan china those are the the most experienced as of today so they have published a report where uh, a series of 34 patients who were operated and took a level 3 uh, uh, operation theater system where these were the surgeries that were performed cervical spine decompression hemi replacements for neck femur lower limb debridements lower extremity muscle excisions removal of plates and total hip arthroplasties and what did they observe the observations were that 15 of the 34 people needed icu care which is about 44% which if you compare it with uh, a normal high hospital icu care that is required for a patient without a surgery which is 26% it is almost one and a half times which is alarming what was important was that these patients had a direct history of exposure they had no symptoms prior to surgery which is basically uh, indicates that a uh, asymptomatic patient may be an asymptomatic carrier or they may be in an incubation period which means that these patients will deteriorate much faster post a surgery and the surgery becomes a stress for uh, uh, a, a precipitating factor for deterioration of these patients other than the risk it is going to cause to uh, uh, the healthcare communities the first symptom to dyspnea time is much shorter 2.5 versus 5.2 the tested covid patient they tested covid positive immediately after surgery and a lot of these patients were older they had comorbidities they underwent surgeries with longer operating time and more complex surgeries which means that this has to be a guide of what we don't want to do the impact on the orthopedic community as the uh, the wuhan experiences they did a, a multi center study of eight hospitals and 26 surgeons who tested positive the incidence rates were between 1.5 and 20.7 amongst the healthcare community the suspected sites of exposure were the general wards about 89 80% of the times public places in the hospital like uh, lifts like the opd uh, registration desks about 21% of the times operating rooms about 12% of the times and icus and opd's about 4.2% of the times and this is a situation where the opd's were shut and what is the risk that the doctors carry back home they are likely to infect their family 21% of the times they are likely to affect colleagues 4.2 4% of the times patients 4% of the time and friends whom they interact with 4% of the time so please do not jump into what we would normally go in and operate so the real time training was noted to have an operate a protective effect wearing an S, a respirator had a protective effect not wearing one was an independent risk factor for uh, yeah, contracting the covid positive virus severe fatigue long hours long shifts icu shifts was an independent risk factor so the broad guidelines that have come out on 23rd march uh, by the indian orthopedic association as to what to do in the emergency department is you have joint dislocations reduce them in the emergency if they are stable send them home with slabs do not worry about the standard treatment that you would do otherwise for them most upper limb injuries including clavicles humerus wrists will need conservative treatment even if they are not perfect reductions you look at later reconstructions once all this dies down once the system comes back to normalcy and reboots itself but not right now 
ligamentous injuries they may be treated with bracing any instability any amount of instability will need a later reconstruction it's common sense but that's been put into a guideline stab injuries and wounds though they are less the incidence that we are seeing is much lower but still if you have one then the wound is not contaminated and without distal neurovascular deficit you need to wash debride and repair these wounds in the emergency rather than doing the extensive standard uh, uh, the, the procedures that you would normally do abscesses without systemic asepsis ind in the emergency they have to be disposed of from the ed in patients patients you would normally take as in patients <clears throat> you have to stress we have to remember that the more we can treat patients whom we would normally treat as in patients non operatively and do a later on reconstruction of some kind or a delayed primary or a, or a delayed reconstruction uh, is what we need to think about we have to look at minimizing the follow up visits of our patients the first point opinion that we give in the emergency has to be by a single a senior person so that the time that the patient spends in the ed and in the healthcare facility where the possibility of of uh, not maintaining social distancing is reduced they need to be quick consults they cannot be spending and wasting time and having a patient uh, waiting in the emergency uh, for a longer time predominantly we need to look at emergency based treatments we need to admit only if there is no other alternative you need to do a basic radiology workup there is no scope we have we have banned ct scans uh, in the process in the period of the covid epidemic and they will need to be done only and only if they are required so only x rays for treatment because <laughs> minimize follow up visits patients who are operated and on follow up they can have delayed suture removals without uh, affecting their care you can call these patients and look at their wounds on a video call or on a whatsapp call and you can treat with it accordingly telemedicine is is going to be a very very big support for how we are going to be able to deliver healthcare to our patients and whatsapp and uh, facetime calls are going to be very very important the distribution of trauma load across the major uh, trauma centers has to be done so if there are three hospitals we need to distribute the workload amongst us rather than doing everything ourselves and putting our own healthcare uh, workers to risk polytrauma the stable fracture open injuries compartment syndrome exsanguinating injuries if at all though the incidence is going to be much lesser have to be done on an emergency basis alternative techniques of soft tissue reconstruction and delayed reconstructions to avoid multiple surgeries at a given time have to be advocated hip and femur fractures need emergency treatment they have to be done where you need to do a total if maybe a hemi replacement is a better and a faster option on the given date we need to stage manage of these complex injuries so that the length of stay is decreased simple periarticular fractures will go to day care treatment rather than getting the perfect anatomical reconstruction that we teach on your courses upper limb fractures need to undergo day care surgeries wrist injuries have to be treated with removable splints and casts you need to use absorbable sutures and wall form and warn your patients for mild inflammation and just monitor them through your phone calls and whatsapp calls so that they are peaceful and they are comfortable spine fracture mm -hmm. to deal with bracing you have a cord equina syndrome it will need emergent emergent treatment septic arthritis patients prosthetic joint infections infected fractures without with systemic features will need an emergency treatment but those who do not have systemic features they can do very well with suppression therapy and antibiotic therapy most pediatric injuries will can be treated conservatively all electives can be deferred for a later date the important covid room uh, covid operating room etiquettes are you maintain a negative pressure operating area with a buffer zone and a clear zone the donning and doffing has to be of pp has to be in the buffer zone patients have to wear caps and masks so as to not infect the healthcare worker community each team in a level 2 level 3 risk areas have to do maybe a 4 or a 6 hour shifts and not do extremely long shifts there have to be isolation zones in the hospital so to end the take homes that we have for uh, orthopedic treatments in the times of covid are that we need to triage sensibly and deliver healthcare the healthcare delivery will not be like that of a non covid time we have to maintain capacity for emergency surgical uh, operations which the indications will change as i mentioned we have to protect and preserve the workforce this is the most critical part of the entire thing because this 
uh, is not a replenishable workforce. We have to fulfill alternate surgical roles and even surgical doctors and even surgical registrars will need to look at ventilatory duties and will need to look at some medical support duties. So life will usually if it goes smoothly, sometimes a lot of unexpected happens and this is probably the most unexpected that we happen, but certain possibilities will come out and in due course of time, there is extensive research going on which essentially is looking at how the COVID positive patient can be a useful healthcare worker or a support staff and the plasma can be used extensively. So a lot of work research is going on in this department. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Abai.